Good morning to members, friends of Congregational Church of the Valley. We welcome you to this service of worship as we move into the month of September. And hopefully we will look forward to a time soon when we can all be together. But for now, we are here through media and we are thankful for these media gifts that have been able to get us together at times that we cannot be together in a physical way. The title of the sermon today is Projection. If you'll notice, uh, clear out through the Bible and through the stories of Jesus, you'll find how many people were projecting a lot of negative things on him, basically because he was challenging them at the very core of their beliefs. We'll be talking about that in a moment. We hope that you will be blessed indeed uh, by all that we do in this service. And before we receive that message, let us gather around the piano and be blessed by the wonderful music of Larry Lober. Our scripture this morning is taken from John's Gospel, the sixth chapter, verse 51. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Bread, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. May God add understanding. Gary Wallace wrote a book and said something that I find to be very true. There is something, he says, we cannot quite put into words, some inarticulate moan that issues from deep within us, 
some sense that our hearts will never be at rest until they rest in God, as St. Augustine said many years ago. Culture tells us that we will be restless until we get things that we need, the things we want. What we need is not material, but it is spiritual. And there's great confusion around this. The hunger that drives us to cookbooks and restaurants, <clears throat> and then after that to diet clubs and health clubs. The emptiness we try to pack with possessions, the way we may try to fill ourselves up with more recognition, more titles, more awards, more experiences. Could there not be our spiritual? Is that not a sign of our spiritual emptiness crying out to God? These are Wallace's words. Could they not be a spiritual hunger, hunger pains that we are experiencing a lot in our world today? We are kind of like a blank movie screen upon which our culture projects on us our need for what we have enough of. I don't need to remind you of how many advertisements you see in a day. I know somebody chalks up the number that that uh, would be. And every one of the advertisements are really letting you know that you can't possibly live without this. And so it gets projected on us and oh my goodness, uh, I need uh, more of what I've got enough of. What our soul is yearning for is a deep sense of the holy, a deep desire for what Jesus calls bread from heaven. Our text today is kind of strange in a way uh, because he's talking about the bread from heaven that you, you'll, you'll never be hungry uh, again. There are some people that have connected that with communion. Some people think that's kind of barbaric for us to think of the broken body and the blood of Jesus in that particular feast. But the deal is, here he is saying, there is a bread from heaven. There is a way of being and seeing in the world where you will not hunger again. Carl Jung said, I have treated many hundreds of patients among those in the second half of life. That is to say, over 40, there is not been one whose problem in the last resort was not that of finding a spiritual outlook on life. That's a hard one for our culture to hear. There was uh, a young man, probably in his 30s, that wrote a book that I was intrigued by. It was called Life After God. His name is Douglas Copeland. And I was intrigued by the book. And at the very beginning of the book, he just says, well, you know, we don't have time for God anymore. Sunday school is old hat, and, you know, uh, we're not gonna go to church any longer. And uh, this God stuff is uh, passe. We're not gonna pay any attention to that any longer. And then after saying all of that, he said, you know, toward the end of the book, I'm gonna tell you a secret, but not right now. And so you go through the book and then he comes down to the end, the very last paragraphs, and this is what he says. Now here is my secret. I tell it to you with the openness of heart that I doubt I shall ever achieve again. So I pray that you are in a quiet room as you hear these words. My secret is that I need God, that I am sick and I can no longer make it alone. I need God to help me give because I no longer seem to be capable of giving, to help me be kind as I no longer seem capable of kindness, to help me love as I seem beyond being able to love. My main point today is this. Everywhere we are told that our deepest need is material, while our souls are screaming for the spiritual life that is deeply needed in every human being. Let me uh, give you a definition of what I call psychological projection. 
psychological projection uh, is when I don't deal with my own problems and weaknesses and I blame all of my problems on you. At one time I had mentioned in one of our presentations here uh, that perfectionism doesn't work and if we don't deal with that we fall to a level of ambition and if that doesn't work and it will not work then we fall into vindictiveness. So because I don't want to deal with myself I just go into the office and I start blaming everyone else for the problems that have come to reside in me. Gordon Livingston uh, if you don't have a pencil nearby and a piece of paper, please get it now. I can give you two seconds to do that. Okay, the time is up. Gordon Livingston wrote a fabulous book. He is a psychiatrist. It's entitled, So Soon Old, So Late Smart, 30 True Things You Need to Know Now. I have a minister buddy uh, down in Georgia who said that after reading that about 10 years ago, maybe a little longer than that, uh, he said he went and ordered uh, as, as many as 100 copies and he gave that to people because of the great wisdoms in very short chapters uh, that are so incredibly meaningful to say the least. There is in one chapter, he says, the statute of limitations has expired on most of our childhood traumas. In other words, some of the things that we project onto other people have to do with the way that we were brought up as children. Okay, we all know that. And if I have those kind of pains, I need to go and sit down with a counselor and work that on through. I don't need to come to work and dump my pain on you. Some people are content to hold on to childhood traumas as their excuse for being the hostile person that they are right now. Well, you know, I can't help it. You know, I've already told you how I was treated as a child. He says the statute of limitations runs out on that. Richard Rohr has taught me this. What is not healed, let's talk about childhood dramas. What is not healed in the counseling office will be passed on inevitably, absolutely so. If you don't face your childhood pain in therapy, you will indeed pass it on to family and fellow workers. And that is so incredibly true. There's a man by the name of David White. He's a poet. And he's done a lot of work with, uh, with corporations, kind of teaching them to look at the poetic side of life and how that might fit into their business life. He wrote a book entitled The Heart Aroused, and he's making this same statement that is made by other psychologists. He said, you can blame your mother, you can blame your father and his father for the problems with which you are destined to wrestle with. But ultimately, you are the one in whom they have found a home. You are the one who must say, thus far and no farther, and then go down and confront those problems yourself, which would certainly be a journey into therapy with great hope and great possibility. So my point is this, we must stop projecting our pain and problems on others and face them ourselves before we can taste the bread from heaven, that, that good life that Jesus wants us to have, that has given his own life, that we might have life. That life will elude us unless we pay attention to certain kinds of things that need healing in us or else we will inevitably pass them on to someone else. Now secondly, I want to talk about theological projection. Probably the hottest button that I've got in my soul has to do with false images projected onto God that do so much damage to human beings. How many times do you think I've had people come into my office in ministry and say, well, they told me that I got to accept it because it's the will of God after some just terrible thing has happened in their life. I was working with a group of men in Minnesota 
with a uh, community building workshop. There were like 50 men in a big wide circle. And basically in these workshops, people were being able to tell for the first time some of the incredible painful stories of their lives that have never been shared before. So one by one, without trying to heal or fix them, we would listen to many, many stories. I shall never, ever forget one man sitting across from me in a plaid shirt who told of the terrible time that his youngest daughter, seven years of age at the time, had some terrible disease and she would go into all kinds of convulsions. They had to give her shots on a daily basis and all. They kept doing this for, for year upon uh, a year, for, for like two and three years in a, in a row. And finally, finally, it didn't work any longer to keep her alive. And they were all worn out and this little girl died. And then he said, you know, I have never cried about her death. And somebody said, why not? I said, well, I had a neighbor who goes to church who came and told me that I must accept that because it was the will of God. God was trying to teach me a lesson by killing my daughter. We sat in horrified silence for an entire minute. And the guy seated next to him turned to him and said, you know that's a load of crap, don't you? He said, I always thought it was, but I never thought I had the right to question what my neighbor said. And that man fell into a pile of tears that had been held back for 10 years. The first tears held back by bad theology projected on him. I can never forget his face. Truer images of God can help. Dr. John B. Cobb, Jr., my teacher in seminary, taught me in the first year I was there that, Dick, God's power is not manipulation. God is not coming down and let's zap this kid. Let's save this one right here. Oh, yeah, I got saved because of this. That's not how God works. God's power is persuasion. Persuasively calling us forward no matter what happens to us in life. I came to appreciate Dr. Cobb greatly. He's in his 90s now. I went to see him a few months ago. And as a matter of fact, I was going to see him the week that we had to shut down everything with COVID-19. And he said, we'll get together soon, and I'm sure we will. So here I was in seminary. And in 1970, our second child was born, John Robert. And within 24 hours, it was announced to us that he has Down syndrome. My first reaction was, these things don't happen in our family. Mother told me a long time ago, if, if, if we just do the right things in life, everything's going to turn out fine. Mother was quite wrong, but I do recognize that was the theology she was brought up with. And so, for a couple of days, I had some extreme grief. And then uh, a doctor helped us by saying, uh, as I went to a doctor and my older son was sitting there and I said, well, how far is John going to go in life? He said, well, your other son, Rich here, he says, how far is he going to go in life? I said, I don't know. He says, well, we don't know how far John will go either. Just take him home and love him and see how far they'll both go. And I'll never forget that doctor. So here I am walking across the campus shortly after John's birth. And here comes Dr. Cobb walking toward me. And he said, I heard about the birth of John. He said, I'm glad you know that God doesn't cause these things, but is the one who will go through all of these things with you. And then he said, parenthetically, how lucky John is to have parents like you. And I'm here to tell you right now how lucky 
I have been for all of the lessons that son John has taught me in this life. Once upon a time, God was unsuccessful in getting through to us. So scripture says he decided to come to us in flesh. Just not getting through. This spirit stuff ain't getting through. So come to us in flesh. I remember the story about a, a, a boy that was afraid one night. He goes into his bedroom on his own and, and they, they closed the door. And he kept opening the door and says, uh, I'm, I'm afraid. And they said, well, you don't have to be afraid. You know, they closed the door again. And so after about three times, he said, son, you don't have to be afraid. God is with you. He said, yes, I know that, but some, this is the time I need someone with skin on. Not like that spirit stuff. And who of us cannot say the same for ourselves? All of these mysterious bread of life images are attempts at God seeking to come to us in a real and a, in a palpable way. The birth narrative of Jesus, you know, people look at this Bethlehem story, particularly in the Gospel of Luke, it's absolutely fantastic. You know, we can never live without it in the life of the church. It's just beautiful in every kind of way. The birth narrative, as somebody said, Dick, do you think this is true? I said, of course it's true. Because who but God would think of coming to the human family in the form of a baby? Everyone loves a baby. The most difficult and mean people in the world become silent in the presence of a baby. What a genius. A genius move by God. So here's the truth that came in Mother Teresa. While we are busy projecting our unresolved pain on others, as we are busy projecting false images on God, we need bread from heaven. We need the food from God, the real true image of God. It was Mother Teresa who said of our country, are you listening? She spent a lot of time here. She said, you people are starving people in a land of plenty. She said, the spiritual poverty of the Western world is much greater than the physical poverty of the third world people. You in the West have millions of people who suffer such terrible loneliness and emptiness. They feel unwanted and unloved. These people are not hungry in a physical sense, but they are in another way. They know they need something more than money, yet they don't know what it is. What they are missing really is a living relationship with God. The bread from heaven. Rather than talk about uh, what has gone so wrong, let's look at a life that gets this. That God came to us in flesh who pointed us to the bread from heaven that fills our hunger for God and our need for a meaningful life. Let's get a good example of what that looks like. I say that it would be Angie Garber. Angie Garber, nearing the age of 80, is a woman with many, many stories. She is the daughter of an Iowa farmer. She stayed at home to take care of her mentally unstable mother until late in her life. She got polio, and college was not an option. She has never been married, and at the age of 38, while attending a seminary in Indiana, Angie was asked to teach on a Navajo reservation in New Mexico. For some reason, she said, I don't know why, I decided to go. She decided to go and indeed has been blessed. For 40 years, her focus in life has never been on things. She said, when you love things, you use people. Let's let that sink in. She says, I've got enough. I've got more than enough. She is, for the most part, isolated from the world. The nearest town is Cuba, a village north-northwest of Albuquerque. There's a gas station there that, if you fill up your tank, they'll allow you to use a shower. Angie does not complain, even with arthritis. She said, when I first came here to serve, she said, I just thought this was the most desolate place in the world. I called it a desert. 
Now I call it an oasis. Every morning for more than 30 years, Angie has climbed into her pickup truck and made her rounds. Bread, water, medicine, but most of all, friendship. She once called the Navajo people strangers whom she came to serve. Now she calls them simply friends. She says the only heart that can love is one that is broken. Angie calls on, on Ben. Angie begins reading uh, from her Navajo Bible to him. Ben is old. After doing time in prison, he pointed his life toward the teachings of Jesus. He said, I just can't understand that kind of love, Ben says, shaking his head. I just can't understand any of that. He can't understand the loving way of God. He does understand, though, after 40 years, the love of Angie that she says comes from God. Jesus compared his life to bread, bread from heaven. Angie knows the meaning of that. Her life is full, full to the brim. Angie took Jesus up on these strange bread sayings and found life in the most unexpected places. Perhaps that is the answer to the deep hunger, the deep loneliness and emptiness that plagues our country at this very time. Jesus said, for all who have ears to hear, let them hear. I came that you might have life and have it in abundance. Amen. Let us now pray together. God, it feels like we come here each week carrying to you the same things. Some of us come from the high roads of spiritual excitement. Things have never been better. And, and some of us come carrying heavy pain physically and spiritually because of bad cards dealt us in this random world. Bless all people everywhere who struggle with loss, illness, loneliness, sorrow. Beyond the names of those we love who suffer, we remember those we don't know by name. Bless those worldwide who suffer in unimaginable ways. Bless those caught in opioid addiction and all other addictions. Help us in the words of the apostle to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. God, in your love and mercy, you hear our prayers and know what we need before we ask. And you have promised never to take us away from life's difficulties, but to be with us through all of them. We pray all these things in the name of the one who taught disciples. And so we pray the same by saying, Our Father who is in heaven, holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Thank you. 
And now may the peace of Jesus Christ indeed be with all of us. The one who said, I am the bread from heaven. I bring you the spiritual food that you really need. May we be blessed as we seek to follow as closely as we can the life that he calls us to. May the peace of God be with you this day and always we pray, amen.